Hey, well, welcome everyone to A Sailor's Life Live. This is our online program uh, from the USS Constitution Museum in Boston, where we come to you with aspects of life at sea on board USS Constitution in 1812. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm an educator at the museum and I'm excited to be joined today by one of the active duty Navy crew members on board USS Constitution. So I wanna turn things over to him so he has a chance to introduce himself to you all. Hey there guys, my name is Jay. Uh, I'm an active duty sailor here aboard the USS Constitution. Uh, thanks for having me on the, uh, the show again or the, the little web series. Um, it's always great to uh, talk about the ship and uh, share some of that naval knowledge with the world. I appreciate you guys having me on here. I know I've been on here a couple of times before. Oh, we love having you on, Jay. Thanks so much for joining us again today. Can't wait to see what you have to show us there on the ship. Uh, yeah, and, and like usual, if you wouldn't mind just to start us off here, give us a, a little refresher, maybe one minute of what USS Constitution is, what it is that makes this ship so important. All right, one minute. Okay, you guys can time me on this. USS Constitution is the oldest commissioned warship afloat in the world. You're not going to find an older ship that's still in the Navy on both sides of Mississippi, right? Mm -hmm. So our ship is 222 years old. Uh, she was there during the beginning of our country, essentially, as far as like ratification of the Constitution itself. And she's followed us throughout time and history, throughout uh, the War of 1812, throughout the Civil War. World War II and uh, current day uh, today. That's right. The ship is uh, key to our country's history. So um, yeah, we're, we're glad that she's still around, right? And that you guys uh, can share all you can about uh, the heritage yeah. of the ship and the Navy today. So thanks for that, Jay. I know it's a challenge in a minute, but you did well there. So now I would just want to add to that by showing you all Another image of the ship, this is USS Constitution, a photo from a couple years ago on one of the underway cruises uh, out in Boston Harbor. So this is our ship and we are going to be focused on an aspect of life on board Constitution today. One thing that's important to know is during this 1812 era for which Constitution is most famous, there were about 450 to 500 crew members who lived and worked together on board this ship. Today, we're going to be focusing on what a day would be like for one set of crew members on board this ship. We're going to be focusing on the ship's boys. So this is a specific group of Constitution's crew. In 1812, there were about 12 boys on board Constitution. Now, when I say boys, and you hear me say this throughout the program, I'm actually referring to the rank of these sailors. A rank in the Navy is really related to your job and where you fall within the, the hierarchy of the different sailors on board the ship. And the rank of boy had a lot to do with the experience level of these particular sailors because ship's boys were this, the lowest ranking of the sailors on board USS Constitution. They had the least experience uh, out of any of these sailors on board the ship. So that meant that they were usually the youngest on board as well. They ranged from as young as eight years old to um, their high teens. So maybe 18 years old, you could still join uh, as a boy without a lot of experience. And a lot of times this was the very first time that these uh, sailors were ever on a ship. So it was definitely uh, time for them to learn the ropes of what it was like to be on a ship like Constitution and to be in the US Navy. So they earned on average between eight to $10 a month for their work uh, as boys on Constitution. We're gonna take a look uh, today together at what a, a day might have looked like for these ship's boys on Constitution. So if we were to travel back in time 200 years to a Wednesday in 1812, what would these boys have been up to on the ship? That's what we're going to talk about today together. And it's important when we talk about what they might have been doing to think a little bit about how the day was structured, not only for the ship's boys, but for all sailors on Constitution. 
It was something called a watch schedule, basically. The Navy, they split up the 24 hours of the day into four hour, typically four hour shifts called watches. And so you could expect to be doing a particular job or a task for those four hours at a time. And then after that four hour watch had ended, you would move on to something else. It would rotate through the day. So you're working for four hours. Board. The first was something like this here. Basically, it means that it takes 30 minutes for all the sand in one part of this glass to make its way to the other part. So they tell time on the ship by ringing the ship's bell every time a 30 minute a period had passed every time it took 30 minutes for the sand to fall to the other part of the hourglass. So in the beginning of a watch, after the first 30 minute period, you'd ring the bell once and you'd flip your glass. Then after the second 30 minute period, you'd ring the bell two times. Uh, and then you would go on and on until you reached the end of your four hour watch. The bell would ring eight times and then it was time to start it all over again. So that's keeping time on the ship. And Jay, can we check in with you? Can you just tell us where the ship's bell would have been on Constitution? All right, absolutely. So our ship's bell back in the 1812 era would actually have been on the forecastle, the very forward part of our ship. And it would have been so small and minuscule, actually it would have been a much larger bell. Because you have to think, bigger bell, larger sound, and you need to communicate time to pretty much everyone on board the ship. Yeah. Our, Today, we do keep the bell on the, our uh, main mist over there, a lot smaller. So do you guys still use the bell today on the ship? Yes, absolutely. We actually just rang it. Uh, every day at 12 o'clock, we rang eight bells, and that signifies that it's 12 o'clock, and we're just, uh, we do that more to pay respects to tradition, rather, and keep time, because we got to watch it now. Yeah, I think our technology has improved a little bit, maybe a little mm -hmm. more reliable. But this certainly worked for the crew in 1812, right? And now we know, yeah. I suppose, if we're visiting the ship and we hear that bell ringing, um, we have a little insider knowledge of what that might mean there. So thanks, Jay. We'll check back in with you uh, in just a little bit there on the ship. All right, everybody. So now we know how the day is structured. Let's get into what these boys were doing on Constitution in 1812. So much like you and I, oop, there's a nice glamour shot of the bell today. Our ship's boys are starting their day by waking up in bed, but for the boys on Constitution, like the majority of the crew, their bed is actually a hammock, like we see in this illustration here. The boys and a lot of the enlisted sailors on Constitution would sleep on the berth deck of the ship. That's three levels down on the ship, and you can see from this illustration, it's pretty tight quarters. So they were sleeping inches away, in some cases, from their shipmates. Uh, but they would be woken up in the morning from their hammocks, most likely by a bosun playing a bosun's whistle or bosun pipe. Now, a bosun is another crew member on board the ship. This is a specific rate of uh, the U.S. Navy. And one of the bosun's jobs was to give commands to the rest of the crew through this instrument here, through his whistle. So he would play the whistle, be a really high-pitched whistle, and with a specific call, the boys would know, okay, it's time to get up. I'm going to take my hammock down, roll it up, and stow it away for the day. Now, before getting started on their first watch of the day, it's important that these boys have a little breakfast, like all of us in the morning, right? So for, for ship's boys, that would often take the form of something like this here. This is a ship's biscuit. Now, ship's biscuits are basically flour, water, mixed together, baked for a long period of time. It kind of ends up turning up like bread, um, but you can hear, hopefully, I bang it on my table here. This is really hard. So it might not be the most appetizing thing for these sailors, for the boys, but these last a long time. They're really easy to make and they store really well. In fact, they last so long that we have a ship's biscuit on display in the museum that was served on Constitution in 1861. So 
these things last a really long time. But they made a good quick breakfast uh, for a ship's boy to eat before he got started on his first watch of the day. Now, again, these boys, they are the least experienced crew members on our ship. So they're not gonna be asked to do jobs that require a lot of technical knowledge or ability because they simply don't have that yet. But uh, that means that the majority of the tasks they're being asked to do end up looking a little bit more like chores on board the ship. So one of the first things that they could do in the morning on that early watch was to holy stone the deck. Now, holy stoning the deck, that's a really interesting word, something we might not be familiar with. Jay, can you tell us a little bit more about what holy stoning is and why, why you would need to holy stone the deck on Constitution? Yes, absolutely. So if you take a look at my lovely uniform, uh, you'll notice that I'm wearing dress shoes. These are very tight, made of leather, uh, pretty good quality. However, back in 1812, they didn't really have shoes. They were more walking on the decks with their bare feet, uh, which just amazes me altogether because you have to consider how hot it is and then how cold it is here in Boston. You know, very, uh, the shoes were available, but they're very exclusive, right? You had to have some, uh, some green on you, have some good money. So. That being said, these sailors are walking on these wooden decks made of wood. Now, what's the number one thing you think of? What do you think of wood? Number one, I or one number one thing I think of when I think of wood is splinters. So, therefore, comes in the holy stone. Now, what sailors would be ordered to do is they would get a holy stone, which is simply just like a big rock, and they would scrub the deck of all the grime, uh, sea salt, and the splinters, therefore allowing crusaders to walk around the decks um, without getting a splinter in their cell. All right, that's right. So holy stoning, I guess, just makes a safer spot for these sailors to be working, right? And I imagine it's also important to help just with the maintenance of the ship. You talked about how this is a wooden ship. Yeah, splinters, that would really be bad. And it's also important, I think, just to keep the ship in a nice condition so that it lasts, right? The Navy spent a lot of money on these ships early in our country's history. And so it's in the best interest of the crew and the best interest of the Navy to keep the, the ship well maintained. So do you guys hold us on the deck still today? Oh, today, no. Today, uh, we don't really do that too often. We have, uh, we have some kind of uh, paste that we put on the decks, which is kind of just lacquers. That means we're lacquer. And we also have shoes. So we don't really need to do that too often anymore. So you guys lucked out. You don't have to get on your hands and knees then to, to do That's this. Definitely in born in the right time of period. <laughs> maybe, maybe. So I just have a couple of images um, that will help supplement that visual for us. But I also have a, a holy stone with me here to show you guys. So like Jay said, this is a, a fairly large stone. I happen to have a smaller one that fits in the palm of my hand with me here. Now, this holy stone is pretty heavy, but if you look closely, I put it up toward my camera here, you'll see that it has a kind of rough edge here. And that made a really nice surface for scraping off all of the grime or dirt or just day to day stuff that gets on the deck um, to make that nice clean surface that's safer for the, the crew to do their work, um, shoes or no shoes. Now, um, again, I have an image to give you guys just a visual of what this would have looked like in action. Here's an illustration of our crew on their hands and knees there, um, where they're leaning over and scrubbing the decks with their holy stones. So that's actually where the name holy stone comes from, is from this posture of being down on your knees. It almost looked yeah, like these sailors were praying or in this reverent position. And that's where we get the name Holy Stone to describe these stones and also to describe this task. So this was hard work, especially early in the morning, but it was necessary work for the boys to help with, um, to help create a, a safe environment for our sailors on board the ship. And you all can give a try Holy Stoning at home through one of our online games. So if you wanna see how quickly and well you can Holy Stone Constitution's decks, you can play this game online. Do a little demo for you guys here. 
See, I'm using my mouse. I'm scrubbing, 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 but oof, I ran out of energy. So gotta let that load up a bit again. Just a little bit left. Can I do it? All right, so it, it took me 15 seconds or so to get that deck clean, and I lost energy a couple times, so I might need to practice this a little more. Um, but you guys can give this a try at home. Uh, you can find that on a sailorslifeforme.org, and I see Emily has shared that uh, in the chat as well. So feel free to give that a try after our program today. Okay, everyone, so our first watch as boys, we have spent cleaning the ship and holy sewing the deck, an important job on the, the crew. So for our next period of the morning here, we're gonna spend some time doing an activity that has to do with Constitution's identity as a warship. Because Constitution and other early ships in the Navy, these were built as warships to help defend the United States' interest at sea. And so that meant that drilling or practicing for battle was a key part of daily life for sailors and ship's boys at this time. The boys had a really important role to play in battle and they helped out on the gun team. So I'm gonna pull up uh, an image on the screen now. So this is one of our gun teams in a moment of battle on Constitution. Now I'm curious if you guys can look closely at the screen here, see if you can spot our ship's boy in this image. Remember, these boys are younger than the rest of their, their shipmates here, so he's going to visibly look younger than the others in the image. Feel free to share in the chat if you found him in this depiction, but I'll give you a couple more seconds here to look for him before I reveal his location. All right, there he is, circled in red, almost front and center in this image. There's our ship's boy. Looks like he's almost running toward uh, the rest of his shipmates here at the, the long gun, and he's holding something in his hands. And that is really the key to the role of the ship's boys in drilling on the ship and in battle on the ship. Ship's boys were sometimes known as powder boys or powder monkeys because it was their job to bring the gunpowder, which would be loaded into the guns and ultimately fire these cannons. They would bring that to the gun teams. Now, um, Jay, you're there on the gun deck of the ship, right? Can you look around? Do you see, happen to see, is there any powder stored near you on the ship there? No, there's no uh, powder stowage on this deck. Oh, interesting. Okay, so where would the gunpowder be stored on Constitution? Great question. So our gunpowder would actually be stowed in our aft or forward magazine. Uh, we keep the gunpowder in there and it would be lined in um, copper sheathing. And it was lined in copper sheathing because if something catches on fire, something goes kaboom, you don't want that spreading to the rest of the ship. You know, like we said, it's a wooden ship. And second thing I know about wood is it does not mix with fire. So you want to contain that heat and that combustion. So if something did happen, um, it would be uh, contained and won't spread around. But yeah, so those are down uh, below the uh, berth deck, forward and out. All right. So for safety reasons, then, yeah, we're not going to find our gunpowder next to these guns. But like you said, this would be stored elsewhere in the ship. So let me pull up another image to just show everybody how you just describe those magazines. This is Constitution, right? A model of the ship. We can see there's an arrow pointed to a white strip along the hull of Constitution. That's the gun deck where, where Jay is right now. And the other arrow there is pointing to that forward magazine on the very, very bottom of the ship. So as Jay described, we had two powder magazines on the ship and it would have been the job of the ship's boys to help get the powder from the very bottom of the ship all the way up to the gun teams on the gun deck or even the spar deck of the ship where there was another set uh, of weapons. Now, we saw, as you guys pointed out in the chat, that the boy was the one carrying this box or this canister as somebody described it. And this is a powder canister that helped make that job a little easier and potentially a little safer. So if I open this up, you'll see that tucked inside we have our powder bag. Now I want to pose this question to those of you watching here. 
why do you think the boys cast powder using a canister like this? Why couldn't they just take this powder bag and, and carry this up or pass this up from person to person to the gun crews? What do you guys think? You can share your ideas uh, in the chat about why we might have a canister here. I'm gonna store this away, give you a, a minute to share your ideas. All right, looks like we have one idea it might rip. Okay, that's true. Um, these were sewn together in canvas um, that were fairly secure, but it might fall. These, yeah, there's a risk to a lot of that happening. What if it leaks? You guys are right. So we wanna make sure that it stays secure. The other main reason why we have a canister like this uh, is something that Jay mentioned regarding the, the copper that lined the magazine. So one of the main purposes of this canister is to protect the powder bag from any sparks or fire sparks from the other guns that are going off. If a spark were to catch on that powder bag, it could, it could ignite before we want that to happen. And that could be really dangerous for certainly the ship boy who's carrying that powder bag, but also the rest of his crew around him. So carrying powder safely in a canister like this helped to make it a safer job, something that was, was dangerous uh, in its own. That's right, boom, like someone just said in our chat. We don't want that before the gun goes boom, that's for sure. So the name of the game when it comes to powder passing is safety, like we just talked about, but also speed. Because gun crews on Constitution, they could load, aim, fire these guns in 90 seconds. So in a minute and a half, they could go through this multi-step process to fire their guns. So that means that these boys, they had to be really practiced to be able to pass that powder all the way from the bottom of the ship up to the gun teams that needed the powder as a key step of that process. So just like our ship's boys, you guys, can practice drilling and passing powder at home through another one of our online games. In this game, I'll show you this little demo here, we need to get our ship's boy down to the very bottom of the ship using my arrow keys here, fetching that powder. I have 20 seconds to get them all the way back up to the top, but I gotta avoid obstacles. Don't wanna run into any shipmates or any, cannonballs there. Here I go. Oh man, I just ran into that cannonball. Gotta be a little more careful here. All right, running out of time. Okay, in seven seconds to spare, I got my powder up to the gun team. So I might need a little practice there. Again, you guys can see how well you do at passing powder. Uh, Emily's going to share a link to this game that you can play after our program as well. So it's already been a really busy morning for our ship's boys, right? We've had uh, been woken up by the bosun's whistle. We had a quick breakfast of our ship's biscuit. We cleaned the whole ship, holy stoned the deck, and we practiced for battle by powder passing. So by this point in the day, it's about midday, and our ship's boys have earned themselves a bit of a rest, and it's time for their midday meal. So this meal was known as dinner at this point on the ship, and it was the biggest meal of the day and the longest meal of the day for these sailors. So on a Wednesday in 1812, our ship's voice could expect to be served some delicious salt junk. You can see an image of that here. This was salted meat that had been boiled and reheated. And alongside that, they might have a nice side of some rice or maybe some peas. So this meal might not sound very appetizing to you or I today, but this was a big perk of serving in the Navy. And it would have been for the boys as well. This was reliable meal that you were served every day. Many sailors ate better on the ship than they did at land. And it was high in protein, high in calories. So by this point in the day, you might be feeling a little tired after that hard work in the morning, this meal is gonna help refuel you and give you the energy you need to finish out the day strong. And the boys, they would eat this meal down on the berth deck of the ship. This is the same area that we saw early in the morning with those hammocks strung up. It transforms into a bit of a cafeteria here for the majority of the crew eating their dinner here. You can see our ship's boy. In this case, he's in the corner of this mess cloth here in his group um, eating. This was a nice social time for sailors as well. It was a chance for these boys to really 
learn and hear from his other shipmates some of the experiences that, that these other sailors had, whether it was on Constitution or just at sea. So a good chance to fuel up, relax, and also maybe gain a little bit of knowledge about life at sea as well. But you know, this hourglass is still turning on the ship, that ship's bell is gonna ring again, and we'll know that it's time to start our next watch and to move on to our next uh, task for the day. So another main role of the ship's boys on Constitution was to act as servants, essentially, to the officers on board the ship. Now, that doesn't sound like glamorous work, and it really wasn't in many cases. I took a lot of different forms, but, if you can believe it, there was at least a bit of a potential perk to doing this work on Constitution. If you were working closely or working for uh, one of the officers on board, there was a chance that that officer could take a liking to one of these ship's boys uh, and, and maybe even develop a, a relationship with them. We see that that benefits some of the ship's boys because these officers can help them out maybe sponsor them to help them with a career in the Navy later in their lives. So we'll come back to that idea uh, toward the end of our program here. But for one example of what an officer might ask you to do, I'll show you another image here. So we're looking at an image of the quarter deck of Constitution. The quarter deck is an area on the top deck of the ship, the spar deck, that is really representative of the ship's leadership. It's a space that's kind of exclusive to officers and the captain uh, on that area of the ship. We can see that a ship's boy might be granted access here because one of his key roles in working for the officers was to pass messages between the officers on the ship. So we know this from Navy records at the time. This is from the 1815 regulations or rules on board USS Independence, which was a ship-like constitution from that same time period. So in those rules, it says that three smart boys will be selected and put into each watch. They are to stay on the quarter deck to carry any of the officer's messages. So there we have it. We know in 1815, on any given watch on Independence, we could find three boys who were carrying messages between the officers. And I love this little detail that they have, that the boys should wear caps with a winged mercury painted on them. I don't know if anyone uh, has studied Roman mythology at all, but Mercury was the Roman god of many things, including communication uh, and uh, messages. And so this little homage to that is really just a, a visual on the uniform of these boys that they were the ones who were carrying messages quickly between the officers because mercury is often depicted with wings on a hat and on sand as well speaks to how quickly he would get word from person to person just like the ship's boys on constitution so there we have it another watch has passed we've passed the messages for these officers and all the, the work that wouldn't be involved in that. So at this point in the, the boys' stay, you might have earned a little bit of downtime before the final meal. So in a free time on the ship, these boys could play a game, they could play some music, depending on how much time they have, or they could spend some time learning from the experience of other shipmates and practicing their own uh, ship knowledge. So one of the things they could do was to learn the ropes quite literally by practicing their knot tying. Now rope or line as it's called on the ship was so key to so many aspects of life on board this ship. So there were a lot of knots that sailors would know how to tie and that the boys would need to learn as well. Here's uh, one of those knots here. I think this is one of the more fun ones. This is called a monkey's fist. And if you learned how to tie a monkey's fist, this would be a really uh, nice extra grip if you had to grab onto a line and needed a little bit extra leverage there. This is a really useful knot for you to learn and for a boy to practice. So Jay, I wanna check in with you again, just to kind of prove this idea that there are lines everywhere on the ship here. Can you just find an example or show us an example of one of these ropes, which we know are called lines on the ship, uh, and what it's doing in your particular example. Absolutely, so you've got this line right here, which is attached to the bulkhead and the gun herself. And I'm just kind of sitting on it right now, but uh, 
This was used to secure the gun by pulling your inboard or outboard. And this line actually leads into this funny little design right here, which is called a blemish. Right now, uh, a blemish is more like a, like a fancy way to uh, coil up a line, but uh, we just keep it like this so it's not all over the decks. However, in 1812, uh, we actually use this line to hold in the gun inboard, outboard, and then we even still use lines today. If you take a look behind you, we actually have um, these lines that were tied by our deck part that uh, guide people around the ship. And that's just on the gun deck. We have uh, tons more on the spar deck. It's just right above us. That's right. All the, the rigging, right? That helps the ship move. So, do you guys have to learn knots to, to be on Constitution's crew today? No, no. So, on, uh, in boot camp, they do require that you learn a few knots, but uh, here at Constitution, it's not really a, a thing that you have to know. However, it's really great to know it, especially if you do work in deck department and you do want to bring that to the ship. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of that has to do with the, the fact that the ship isn't traveling out at sea as much as it used to anymore, right? So like you just showed us with that gun, those lines are keeping those wicked heavy guns from moving all over the place. So uh, that's not as much of a concern I expect anymore. So that's great. Thanks for showing us those examples. So as we just saw, our boys could be learning the ropes, learning their knots um, toward the end of their day until they reach their final meal of the day, which was known as supper. Um, that was a smaller meal. It's not a big dinner like you or I might have today. And it's usually made up of leftovers from the earlier uh, midday meal we had at our lunchtime. And after that, depending on the time of year or the captain of the ship, you might be granted a little bit more free time before it was time to wrap up your day and end it right where we began on the berth deck, back in our hammock, tucked in after a hard day's work on Constitution. I know if I were a boy, I would definitely want to, to try to get a good night's sleep because you would know that you would have to wake up and do this all over again for another day of hard work uh, and, and adventure on, on the ship with your crew. So before we wrap things up today, I do wanna share quickly just the story of two boys who actually lived and worked on Constitution in the 1800s. So at the museum, we've done a lot of research into the lives of these real people who were on the ship 200 years ago. And out of some of this research, we found some really fascinating people. So the first one that I wanna introduce you to today is a boy named David DeBias. So here he is on your screen. This is not the real David DeBias. Um, this is a, photo, a modern photograph, of course, but this uh, certainly David would have looked like this young boy here because we believe that David was eight years old when he joined Constitution's crew. Can you imagine that? Just take a minute for a second. If any kids were watching, if you're around eight years old, if you have a sibling close to eight years old, or even for some of your parents or adults who may be watching, imagine being eight years old uh, and joining a crew like Constitution, joining a warship in the U.S. Navy. Can't imagine what would be going through your mind. Um, but David, he was born here in Boston, a uh, part of Boston's free black community. So he was born in 1806, lived on Belknap Street, which is now known as Joy Street in Beacon Hill. And if you're familiar with Boston neighborhoods and landmarks, that's over where the State House is um, now. And so David, at eight years old, his father signs him up to join the Navy and to join Constitution's crew. Now, probably being a, a free black family at this time, life was not easy for um, the DeBiases. And so that a monthly wage of eight to $10 was something that David would earn regularly. And he, like many of his shipmates, could send some of that money home to help support his family. Uh, and David, if he joins in 1814, he's joining right in the midst of the War of 1812. So he's joining as a boy because he has very little experience at eight years old, certainly. And he's on board Constitution for one of the major battles of that war. And this is when David and his crew find themselves in a battle with not one, but two British ships called Cyan and Levant. 
and David and the crew, they are victorious, even though they're outnumbered. They defeat both of those British ships. David is put on what's called a prize crew. So after winning, he and some of his constitution shipmates are put on one of those British ships so they can sail it back to a friendly port and the Americans can repurpose that ship for their own use. However, they run into a problem because they run into a British squadron. That squadron captures David and the rest of the crew and they become prisoners of war. They're sent to a prison in Barbados. And for a couple months until the War of 1812 ends, David is spending time as a prisoner of war there. Now, luckily, it's only a few months later that the war does end. And at that time, David and the rest of his shipmates, they are released from that prison. Uh, David is free to go home at that point. We do know that David sor uh, serves, excuse me, another tour of duty on board Constitution later in his life as well. So certainly a remarkable story here of David DeBias. And another boy of Constitution who I wanna share with you guys uh, is a, one named George Syrian. Now George, he is from Greece and he uh, is orphaned unfortunately during the Greek War of Independence uh, in the 1820s. He serves on Constitution a couple years after David DeBias and George joins about three years after losing his parents when Constitution is in the Mediterranean. He joins as a boy, of course, he's no experience on a ship like this. And he is actually an example of one of these boys who benefits from a relationship he develops with one of the lieutenants on board the ship at this time. So one of these lieutenants uh, really kind of takes George under his wing and helps sponsor him so that he's able to rise in the rank. Uh, he gets promoted, you can think of it that way, when he proves he can do the work and becomes a gunner on Constitution. So he helps operate those long guns where we saw Jay on the gun deck uh, and where we saw our gun crews operating those in battle. Now, George, he actually goes on to have quite a, a career in the U.S. Navy as well. He serves three tours of duty on USS Constitution, and he's the only sailor that we know to do this. Um, he serves on over 20 U.S. Navy ships, seven shore stations, so he is a, a really good example of somebody who's starting out at the very bottom of the, the rank of the crew as a boy, and he turns that into, through hard work and connections that he develops, a really long career for himself in the Navy. We're lucky to have some, some objects that belong to George in our collection, including this portrait here. You know, we have a lot of portraits of captains of Constitution, these important high-ranking officials, but it is so rare to have a depiction, let alone a portrait, of the rest of the ship's crew, especially a ship's boy, these youngest low-ranking crew members. So um, we feel lucky to have this. This was commissioned or, or paid for by that lieutenant who helped uh, George throughout his Navy career. So it's really neat to be able to see this, to see the real George Syrian and what he would have looked like as a boy on Constitution. So those are just two examples we have of boys who have had quite a career Looks like we've got an eight-year-old uh, in the audience. So you guys can see that, imagine what it would have been like to be someone like David on the ship. You would have had to be, um, I think, really brave and to learn a lot um, quickly to, to do what you had to do on a warship like Constitution. Now, Jay, before we end, I wanna just check in with you again here, because I'm curious if you could give us a little perspective uh, again from the modern Navy. So, is there still a rank of boy in the U.S. Navy today? Um, and I see a question kind of potentially related to that, which is, do ships boys have to be the gender of boy? In 1812, girls couldn't serve on, on the ship, but maybe that's changed today. You can share that with us too. Um, and then the second part of my question is, you know, someone like George Syrian, he's really able to create a career in the Navy. And, and what does that process look like today for you in the Navy? Okay, all right. So the, well, the first question about the rank of boy in the Navy, uh, that's no longer a thing. Um, that was a thing back in 1812, but today the lowest rank you can be is a seaman or crew. Um, that's pretty much it, that's RE1. And then from there, uh, seaman apprentice, seaman, petty officer, and uh, whatnot. And then the second part of that question I think was um, can a girl be a ship's boy? 
like we were saying earlier, um, there are no uh, enlisted females on board the ship uh, back then. So, and then today we don't have um, the rank of boy. But yeah, you could be a female seaman or crew, absolutely. Um, that's definitely a thing. And then the last question was, I believe, um, how does it look from someone starting from such a low place going up? How does that look? Is that, what was the question again? Yeah, yeah. So how would, you know, if you were, George Sherian was in the Navy today, would he be okay. able to rise in the ranks like this, like he did? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're worth your salt, you work hard, you make the right connections, and you get lucky enough to um, serve in a position that offers the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we have a lot of programs in the Navy now, uh, either through just like advancement from E1 to E2, E3, whatever. Um, you could even apply to become an officer as an enlisted person, really jump up. Um, yeah, there's plenty of opportunities to uh, build yourself up in the Navy, not even just in the Navy. You can build yourself up in the Navy and then take those skills and then apply them to the real world um, real world aspects of all. Oh, yeah, so that is interesting. You know, we've talked about so much that has changed um, since 1812, but mm -hmm. it does sound like that opportunity, if you can, if you can see that your position too um, is still there. So that's good to hear. Um, and I just want to shout out this in the chat. We had some comments to say that's sad, no girls. And it is sad, no girls on the, the, the ship in 1812, but your crew has plenty of, of female um, sailors there today. So that is something that we can say um, has certainly changed since 1812, that's for sure. So we're running pretty close to our time here, everybody. Um, Jay, do you have any final words for our group before we, we sign off for the day? Uh, if you're in the Boston area, uh, make sure to come through, check out the ship. I uh, would we'll be happy to give you a guided visit of uh, Old Ironsides. And if not, make sure to keep up with our uh, daily virtual tours on our Facebook page. That's right. So it's exciting now we can share with you all that both the ship and the museum have reopened to the public. So you can come visit us in the Navy Yard. The museum's open Thursday through Sunday. The ship is open Friday through Sunday. Um, so come check us out. Uh, and Emily in the chat is going to share the information you need to purchase your advance tickets to the museum and some other uh, guidelines there. I know you guys on the crew, our staff, the museum have been working hard to make that a, a safe and fun experience for everybody. So if you're around, we hope to see you guys uh, back in the Navy Yard soon. So uh, thanks everybody for, for watching today. Jay, thanks so much for joining us again, sharing all of your great knowledge and experience on constitutions. Great to have you back. Um, thanks to our camera person over there on the ship. And we are uh, hopeful that you guys can help us out at the end of this program by filling out a brief survey that's gonna pop up on your screen as soon as our webinar is over. So we thank you guys for your feedback. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, we'll be back in a couple weeks with another episode. Until then, take care everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. <laughs>